Great. Okay, um, we're going to go on with the next presentation for the day. And again, once uh, once again, a thank you to our sponsors, Family Tree DNA. Thank you. Thank you also to Jared Corcoran for um, live streaming these uh, lectures on Facebook with the permission of the speakers. Um, so uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Andrew Millard. Now, Andrew is Associate uh, Professor of Archaeology at uh, Durham University. He has a BA in Chemistry, a DPhil in Archaeological Science. He's a member of ISOC, Society of Genealogists, the Guild of One Name Studies, and a variety of family history societies. He also is the chair of the trustees of Gen UKI, um, which I think you probably pronounce Gen Yuki. Genuki. 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 But Andrew also um, has a keen interest in the Scottish prisoners, and you have a website and a blog about that as well. well yes, we, that's a, yeah, the, project, the Scottish prisoners of war. They were imprisoned in Durham. Um, we excavated some of their skeletons five years ago. So there's a project website that with their descendants of some of those who survived, went to New England. So there's a lot of genealogy to do there as well. Yes. 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 Turn, I'll turn that up as well. But um, so uh, today, what Andrew's going to talk to us about is the Watto tool. What are the odds? Uh, which he has provided the statistical input um, and has worked very closely with Leah Larkin and Johnny Pearl on this particular tool, which is another great tool um, to use with your DNA matches. So can you please give a big warm round of applause for Andrew Miller. Okay, so I start by saying thank you to Leah and to Johnny for uh, their contribution. Leah, Leah came up with the idea she said, can we do the maths for this? And we sat down and we put it into a really clunky spreadsheet. Uh, and then Johnny came in and has created a slick interface that is what you're going to see today. Um, and bizarrely, since we started doing this, Johnny and I have discovered a DNA connection between me and his family. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so Watto is about analysing your autosomal DNA matches, um, and uh, I sus I'm suspecting that. Uh, I suppose I ought to ask how many people have, have tried to use Watto? A few, okay. Um, so the idea is mostly to help you fit in those matches that have no trees. Um, so it's really useful if you're working with adoptees or unknown parentage of some sort, or where you you've done the tests and you've got an NPE and then, but you don't know, of course, the unknown parent is the person you want to locate. Uh, <coughs> so it's based on autosomal DNA. Um, and I probably don't need to tell most of you, we have the 22 autosomes plus the sex chromosomes. We're not using the sex chromosomes here. You get one copy of each from your parents um, and they've got one copy of each from their parents and so on uh, going back. Um, and that means that you can say what the average sharing is expected to be with various different relationships. Um, so we ex you expect... Uh, should have a pointer, shouldn't I? Um, you should expect to share... Well, you will share half of your DNA with your mother and father. You will share approximately half of it with a sibling. Uh, you will share a quarter of it, 25%, with an uncle or aunt or with uh, a grandchild. Uh, and so on, and as you go out to more and more distant relationships, the amounts reduce, and, and the averages reduce. Um, but of course, as we all know, when we look at those third, fourth, fifth cousins uh, in our analyses, the amounts are very variable, and they get m relatively more and more variable uh, as you go further and further away. Uh, well, we can still use this chart; is really useful because you can put the um, these relationships into a series of groups which are expected to share the same amount of DNA on average. And that means <coughs> two things. We only have to think about these groups. If you've got two relationships in the same group, you're never going to be able to tell them apart on the amount of DNA because the sharing is expected to be the same. So <coughs> the amount you expect to share, say, with a first cousin twice removed, uh, will be the same as with a second cousin. Uh, and if those are the two relationships you're trying to distinguish between, you can't distinguish between them by the amount of shared <coughs> DNA. You have to bring in other things. Um, 
Of course, the companies will give you ranges. So Ancestry uh, published this chart showing their, <coughs> if you share this amount of DNA, they predict these levels of relationship. Um, at, and it's an interesting chart to look at because you'll see that uh, there are gaps. So what happens if you form between 620 and 680 centimorgans? I have no idea. Ancestry seem to be not predicting what the relationship is according to this table, but they, they will predict something. Um, First cousin, First cousin, most removed, maybe. <laughs> but I've never seen that on Ancestry. I've never seen any removed on an Ancestry, and most of the companies will stick with simple cousin relationships. They won't talk about half relationships, and they won't talk about removed relationships, though I think you'll see those on my heritage. Um, so the companies try and give you these predictions, um, but we all know that when we start reconstructing the gene energies, we quite often find that the reality is different from the prediction, particularly as, as you go to more distant relationships. It's usually, you can usually get this immediate family, uh, grandparents type relationships uh, uh, reasonably well. Um, so, because of this problem, uh, Blaine Bettinger came up with the Shared CM project, where, so this is crowdsourcing data on known relationships, what the companies say the shared centimorgans are, um, and this has gone through several iterations, and now you can see that actually these ranges are wider, so <coughs> um, that that these ranges are wider than the ones that Ancestry published, they're wider than the ones that Family Tree DNA will use. Um, and if you compare a match to the ranges on here, you'll see a greater number of possible relationships than you're getting simply out of the, the company estimates. So that's one way that you can use your sharing with an individual to get a better or a more realistic estimate of the possible relationships uh, a wider range than the, any of the companies are going to give you. Um, but it, it is limited because it's crowdsourced data. So we know, although Blaine has done some filtering, we know that there are probably misstated relationships in there. There are, you know, when there are unknown double relationships, then the amount of DNA will be overestimated for the relationship that has been declared. Um, and there's also a bias in that very, oops, very few of us have data on the very distant relationships. Which, so they're, they're pushed out here on the side of the chart because there's very little data. Uh, but even if I asked you what you share with your fourth cousins, I imagine that most of the fourth cousins you know about the sharing with, you found them through DNA rather than the other way around. Um, and therefore, it's a bias towards the DNA matches that you tend to in in, <clears throat> to investigate which are the higher ones. So that tends to bias this chart slightly to the high side uh, of, of estimates. Um, Ancestry, actually, their estimates are supposed to be based on uh, some simulations that they did. So they took real genomes of real customers and uh, <coughs> simulated the recombination that would happen if they produced offspring. Uh, and did this over many generations so they could see what real genomes look like when you try and match them to one another rather than just a, a theoretical sharing so that if there are there's hidden sharing in the deep ancestry of the population they come from that will be reflected in these totals um, and they published this chart in one of their white papers uh, so you can see uh, what they're saying here is that uh, if we take the red line, for example, so this is uh, first equivalent of the first cousins. Uh, there's, if you share something like uh, 1,300 uh, centimorgans, uh, then it's equally likely to be a first cousin or a, uh, <coughs> um, uh, a half sibling or a, an uncle aunt relationship. Um, as you go down from 1300, the probability that that is a that that relationship is more likely to be a first cousin relationship than a, a closer relationship. In this area between 650 and 1300, the most likely relationship, if you get a sharing there, 
and only thinking about simple cousins, no half relationships, no removeds, uh, then it's likely to be a first cousin relationship. And then, but you can see here the blue line comes in. This is the first cousin uh, once removed, uh, and the probability is going up. So some first cousins once removed will have more than 650 centimorgans, uh, and you've got then a, a, this sort of area here to decide between the two relationships. So you can, you can say something about the possible relationships, and you can say something about the probabilities of those relationships. So if you're looking at the shared centimorgan chart, you can say yes or no to a range of relationships, but you can't say which ones are most likely. With this sort of chart, you can say that if I'm up here at 900 centimorgans, then chances are it's going to be a first cousin relationship rather than a first cousin once removed relationship, but I can't throw out the first cousin once removed relationship. At 650, those two relationships are equally likely. So you can use this... Um, uh, so we, we may be able to use that as well. Um, so this is Leah's comparison of the ranges from various different sources. So the Shared CM project are looking at grouping those relationships by the letters that I showed you earlier. Uh, Ancestry DNA looking at the entire range of those uh, lines on the chart I just showed you and the, com the, the ranges that have been uh, produced by the DNA detectives uh, group. So you see that these are slightly different but broadly comparable so somewhere around 500 to <coughs> 1300 or 1400 is is group c which is your uh, first cousins um, the other ranges vary slightly more um, and again but again you could if you're using these then you can just say yes or no to a group of, of relationships So Leah's idea was that we take these ancestry simulations, um, we, can, we can label them with the, the different groups, and we can then start using the probabilities to say something about what the relationships are. Um, uh, and she produced, Leah went through the painful process of digitizing all of this, uh, so turning the ancestry chart back into numbers so we could have it in a spreadsheet and do calculations from it. Um, uh, and that means you can then go along with your, the amount of centimorgans that you match somebody, plug it in, and see what the different relationships are that it produces. So we had a spreadsheet that did that. It was a bit clunky. It was not very user-friendly. Um, <coughs> but Johnny turned it into to, to something nicer. So here, if you have a... So this is... Johnny's tool, which combines the shared centimorgan product data and the probabilities from the ancestry simulation, so you can see the results of comparing with both of them. Um, so if you enter the amounts of, that you share with somebody, so I've put 336 centimorgans in here, and it will produce a series of probabilities for the different groups of relationships. Um, and uh, if you, <coughs> you'll see here that where these are just plain, then the shared centimorgan project data and the probabilities both say this is a possible relationship. Uh, where you get daggers, then these, this value is outside of the range that's been seen in the shared centimorgan project, but it's possible according to the, the ancestry simulations. Um, and where you get two stars, it's the other way around. It's, it's in the shared <coughs> centimorgan project, but it's not possible according to the, uh, the ancestry simulations. Um, so you get a summary of what both of those charts predict, and you get the probabilities from the ancestry simulations. And if you scroll down, you get a version of the shared centimorgan chart with all the po impossible relationships greyed out uh, and just the possible runs highlighted in colour. So that's all well and good if you've just got one match and you want to know what the possible relationships are. But what if you've got two matches or three matches uh, and you know how they're all related to one another and there's one other person who's unknown and you want to know how they're related. Well, you can go through a process of elimination. Uh, you can run this for each of the matches and see which 
set of relationships fit the different possibilities of the family tree. Um, but you should also, it should also be possible to take those probabilities and do something much more sophisticated, think about which are the most likely relationships rather than just the, the possible ones. So that was the idea of Watto, of what are the odds, is to take the probabilities and think about all the possible relationships and tell you which ones are, are most likely. So this is the, the basic uh, Watto interface. You uh, click and you can enter individuals in a tree. It's designed to work with the descendants of one individual or a couple, uh, and then you can build out the tree of, of descendants from them. Uh, so when you click on each individual, you can set their name, you can give them a child, you can get rid of them, you can say how much they match the person you're trying to fit into the tree, and you can define half relationships with their siblings, So, uh, 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 and you can say this is a place where I think my unknown person might fit in the tree. So here I've tested uh, Graham and Hetty, and... Uh, they match somebody at 300 centimorgans and 236 centimorgans. Where is this person going to be in their tree? Well, you s <coughs> this is a um, sort of second cousin sort of range, but other relationships are possible. Uh, and you can see here in, on this, this side of the tree, there are a series of known descendants of and relations of... of uh, so descendants of their, their ancestors uh, who where this person might fit in the tree. And we might ask, is Ken the father of our unknown person or is Jack the father of our unknown person? Uh, what the tool does is it takes the probability, it looks at the shared centimorgans, it looks at the relationship here. So hypothesis one would be a second cousin once removed to both of these people. Hypothesis two would be that a second cousin to both of these people. And if we look at the amount that they're sharing, then uh, what we find is that the second cousin once removed relationship is ten times less likely than the second cousin relationship. Now, that's a very simple example, just two matches and two possible places in the tree. You can get, build it up to things which are much more complicated. Um, so you can add other hypotheses. Um, so here, extending that tree... What if Caroline and David had a sibling that we don't know about, and if that sibling had descendants, um, <coughs> would that be a better place to fit this person in the tree? Uh, should I be going back to do some more genealogical research to see if this is a, a, a real possibility? Um, so you can see here that we get, again, the relative scores for the different hypotheses. That our match is... A sibling to Caroline and David, David is not possible on the shared amount of DNA that is shared. So we get a score of zero and a, a red marker at that position in the tree. The other two possibilities are, are possible. We get a green uh, and a score, but you can see that they're, these, these are equally likely as the, other, the two that we've got already. Um, because we really haven't got very much information here with just two... Uh, matches at that sort of distance. So this is another second cousin. Well, you could, you know, if one second cousin is possible, any second cousin is possible. Um, we can't tell those relationship. We can't tell one second cousin relationship from another simply on the DNA. We would need some other genealogical information. A first cousin, uh, once removed relationship, uh, has about the same probability as a second cousin once removed relationship, so they only sc <coughs> they're ten times less likely than the second cousin relationships. So if we got to that sort of stage with our tool, then what we actually need is more data. Uh, we haven't really got anywhere to um, say anything useful. So <coughs> let's test some more people and add them to the tree. Uh, so if we find Nick, and he's a great-grandson of, of David, then he's going to be more closely t related to these two possible places in the tree than uh, the people we've tested already, and that helps us to refine our hypotheses. So you can see that 
Hypothesis 2 becomes impossible if Nick only shares 53 centimorgans with our unknown person. Uh, 53 is too little uh, <coughs> for him to simply be a first cousin once removed. So that relationship just is, is eliminated. You can see that this is still possible for him to be a second cousin, and for these, uh, for Graham and Hetty to be second cousins once removed, that all works on the, but it's uh, unlikely. That there's an unknown uh, sibling with a child who is our, our mystery match is not possible, but it's possible that there is a, a grandchild. Um, now, you have to build your trees. You have to think about all the possibilities of different places to put the person in the tree, things that are possible genealogically. I haven't given you any, any dates here, um, but if you know the ages of some of these people, you can eliminate them as potential parents or grandparents. Um, and <clears throat> there may be other reasons to eliminate them as well if they're living on the other side of the world. Um, <clears throat> so it's not just, you haven't just got to think about the DNA, you've got to think about what's the genealogy, what are the possibilities given the genealogical information as well as the genetic information. Okay, so the hypotheses here, uh, nothing I've shown you gets above, we get a score of one, which is always the worst hypothesis that is possible. A score of zero for impossible hypotheses, and here only 10 for the next hypotheses. <coughs> um, if you scroll down, you'll see more detail about these hypotheses. Um, so a lot of people look at this, uh, and then they <coughs> come along to the Facebook group, which is the support group, and post something saying, what's going on here? I don't understand. There's, uh, and they haven't scrolled down. <laughs> so, so don't forget to scroll down there is more information about how the calculations have been done and what they mean so uh, here are our five hypotheses they're ranked in the order of, well they're ranked in the the green ones are ranked in their order of likelihood so the best one is at the top um, and a description here of something about the, the statistical probabilities so the best probability Thing we have here is scoring 10. It's 10 times more likely than the next one, <coughs> um, which is more likely but not really strong evidence. So it says it, it's most likely but not significantly more likely than the next one. This one is possible. These ones are not statistically possible. Um, so we haven't really come to a conclusion with this amount of, of data. Uh, if you scroll down again, there's more information, and that is showing you all the collated match data, and it shows you some, so your hypotheses across the top of the table, the matches down the side, uh, the probabilities drawn from that ancestry chart uh, are given for, and the relationship that is, has been inferred from the tree that you put in, and then highlighted in red, uh, if there's zero, that tells you that this piece of information is actually ruling out that hypothesis, that relationship, and therefore that hypothesis. Um, and then you get the actual odds of the hypotheses compared with the, the worst possible one. So it's all relative. It all depends on which hypotheses you put in. If you don't put in uh, something that's possible, it won't do any calculations for it because it depends on what you've put in. So you have to be putting in the hypotheses, you have to be thinking about what's possible, uh, what might might be possible. Um, so if you go on and do more research and more testing of relatives, so maybe we do find this uh, third sibling and we find his descendants uh, and we test two of them and suddenly we're in the realm of bigger matches, closer matches. Um, <coughs> Uh, so now, hypothesis one isn't possible anymore, and hypothesis two is still ruled out. Um, <clears throat> the possibility of a grandchild of, of Nathan is still there. Uh, I've left out some of the ones that I had before. Uh, but now, the chances are that with these higher scores, our unknown person should be fitting into this branch of the tree rather than the, the two that we had already. Um, so you can, do, you can do this as an iterative process. You can add, as you do more genealogical research, add people and possibilities. Um, and as you do more, 
genetic testing, you can add people uh, into the tree. So now you see we have a score of 1 for our worst hypothesis, and we have a score of 253 for the best one. Uh, and the question is then how to interpret those numbers. Um, so what I <coughs> recommend as a, a baseline for interpreting these is this score system that was derived by Cass and Raftery. Um, so if you get a score of 1 to 3, they say that's not worth more than a bare mention. It's some sort of weak evidence that these, both, these are both possible and one of them is slightly more likely than the other, but really you don't want to worry about it. 3 to 20 is positive evidence. That's probably where you want to focus your research efforts on clarifying that line, finding more testers that are closer in that line. 20 to 150 is strong, and over 150 is very strong evidence. So really, you want to be over 20, and really, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and ideally you'll be over 150 in your score. Um, so although these, this is a useful scale for thinking about how to interpret the scores, um, the odds ratios, uh, we do still remind people that Watto is in beta testing, and you'll have seen that on every screen that I put up. There's a little slash in the top corner that says beta to remind you that this isn't a, a fully functional tested tool, um, and we're still learning about whether it, it whether these uh, odds ratios are working exactly as we think they are. We've had a few cases where we know what the relationship is, and it doesn't. It strongly predicts something else. Um, so it's not <coughs> entirely, uh, you can't rely on it entirely, and what you should really be using it for is a pointer to where to do more research and more testing. Um, because once you've identified which branch somebody is, it, is likely to be in, test somebody as close to them as, as to that predicted position, position as possible. Because the closest matches are the ones to where we can be most certain about what the relationship is. Um, if you get uh, a match at 1400 centimorgans, then you should be thinking about siblings. Um, and that's much more useful information than a first cousin match or a second cousin match. And if you want to know exactly where somebody fits in a tree. Um, so there are a series of things which I should say also about limitations of Watteau. Um, first of all, we assume that the probabilities for each relationship are independent of one another and there's no crossover between relationships. That works as an approximation when the relationships, when two of the matches are not very closely related. So if they're first cousins or more distant, then that will work. If you have a series of siblings that you've tested and they're matching your unknown person, then that will tend to bias the scores that you get out of Watto. Um, and you need to be a bit more careful in interpreting them. Um, and similarly, if you've tested a group of people who are aunts and, uh, uh, aunts and nephews uh, and they're matching, then those people who are closer than first cousins in a group, you have to think carefully about whether the, the, tool, the numbers you're getting out of the tool are actually to be interpreted in the same way. We don't have probabilities to handle things that people are really interested in. So people, <laughs> we don't have any data on double cousin relationships. Now the ancestry simulations that we started with are simple about simple cousins. We don't have data on double cousins, uh, although there are ways for where the double cousin relationship um, <coughs> is. Some double cousin relationships could be could be factored in. If there are things like three quarter siblings, where there's one father and two mothers who are sisters, um, then certainly we're not handling that at all in this sort of tool. We can't have that sort of tree. Um, and we know that it probably doesn't work for endogamous populations. Ancestry simulated this with people that they were pretty sure were unrelated in terms of DNA matching. Um, if you're coming from an endogamous population, then there will be people who are very distant and unrelated in those sort of terms, in their seventh, eighth cousins, uh, but they're sharing much more DNA than, than you would expect. So it doesn't work in those situations. The other <coughs> caveat is that Ancestry didn't simulate what happens below 40 centimorgans, or at least they didn't report it. So uh, we've extrapolated the curves to, use, to, to allow 
things below 40 centimorgans to be used. But that is an extrapolation, uh, a really rough approximation. And so we recommend that if you're using Watteau, at least half of the matches in there should be over 40. Um, so we're not going to be able to make, and I don't think even if we had the simulations, <coughs> if most of your matches are below 40 centimorgans, we're not going to be able to tell apart you know, the fifth cousins from the sixth cousins on this sort of, of tool. Um, because there's simply too much variation and overlap in the possible values that you get at that level of cousinhood. Okay, um, that's how Watto works. There is uh, an old version, which is actually a more advanced uh, version, and I want to say a little bit about how to use uh, this. So there is um, this original version which Johnny produced, which doesn't have all the slick trees in it. Uh, it's just a table that you have to fill in yourself. Um, so it's a bit more work, and you have to do a lot of the background stuff yourself, thinking about the trees, but it allows you to do things that you can't do in the, uh, <coughs> the, the tree building version. So I want to say a little bit about uh, how you can use this, particularly in one uh, situation where you have both maternal and uh, maternal matches to an individual and you want to know, or, <coughs> or perhaps grand matches through the grandmother and through the grandfather or maybe a great-grandfather and great-grandmother, and you want to know where they fit in the tree. Because these are two different sides of the family, you couldn't draw a tree with a single ancestor that branches and comes down to all the matches. So um, this is the tree that I was working from. Uh, so you can see there are two couples up here. Uh, they have a series. They have uh, a son and a daughter who marry and have children and grandchildren. Uh, but they're in there. the other children also have descendants who we've tested. Uh, so we've tested Abby, Bert and Charlie. We've got some matches. We want to know where our unknown person fits in the tree. Are they a grandchild of this couple or a great-grandchild of this couple? Um, and if you looked at any one of these individual matches, you couldn't say whether which, relation, which was the right relationship. Uh, so this would be a first cousin twice removed. That's possible with... 497, this would be uh, a third cousin, possible with 213, this would be a third cousin, that's possible, so it would be the second cousin once removed, uh, and so on. So we have these two possible places the person will fit in the tree, uh, and we need to do a calculation. So you have to draw out the tree yourself, and you have to work out what all the possible relationships are, given the different places they might fit in. So hypothesis one here, uh, if, if our unknown person fitted in the tree at this point, then Abby would be a second cousin once removed, Bert would be a second cousin once removed, uh, and Charlie would be a first cousin once removed. If they fit at this point in the tree, then we get different set of relationships. Abby is third cousin, Bert is a third cousin, and Charlie is a first cousin twice removed. So we have the two different sets of relationships, but it's not drawn out on a nice chart for you, but I can deal with both sides of the family at once. That's the advantage. And then I enter the sharing of each of these with the unknown match and press the button and it does a series of it does the calculations uh, and you get out a less <coughs> friendly uh, output as well but you can see here hypothesis one uh, that it's a grandchild of that couple uh, odds of 479 compared with one for the great grandchild now, if we've just been on an eliminating relationships uh, uh, thing, that wouldn't have, we couldn't have eliminated either of those relationships. But this does suggest that the grandchild rather than the great-grandchild hypothesis is much more likely. Um, it's very strong evidence that that is the right relationship. Uh, and therefore, we would go back and look at the genealogy, look at who we could test, if there's anyone to test, and can confirm that with a, a closer relation. Um, so that's the advanced version of the tool you can draw as complicated a tree as you like um, we've, done, we've done this with a three way <laughs> tree so the three founding couples um, <laughs> with relationships in uh, different cousins marrying 
different descendants <coughs> marrying across the three descendants of the three couples, and we've done a, some calculations on that. If you can if you can draw it out and work out what the possible relationships are for our hypothesis, then you can do the calculations. Um, so <coughs> where might this go in the future? Well, it's in beta still at the moment, so we want to be confirming what we've got and, and verifying that. Um, we are working on more simulations, uh, simulations of our own, so we're not dependent on what Ancestral did, some of which is a bit black box, and we don't know what they did. Um, that would allow us to go below 40 centimorgans. I don't know if it's going to help very much, but we can, we can certainly produce more reliable numbers below 40 <coughs> centimorgans. And we can think about more relationships as well. So we could simulate some of those half relationships, uh, double cousins of various sorts, and then get uh, probabilities for those relationships. <coughs> Ideally, we'd like to be able to draw more complex trees, but uh, that's <coughs> partly a technical issue about how we draw trees online. Uh, it's really easy to draw a tree descending from one couple, and the interface is really easy to, to do. If you try and put two couples in there, it will get a little bit complicated even for you drawing it, let alone for making the software underneath it work uh, well. Um, endogamy, are you going to make it use work with endogamy? People keep asking and I have to say no because I can't, we can't easily simulate what's going on with endogamy. We might be able to draw on some data so there's, there is a collection of data going on for Ashkenazi Jews at the moment by Lara Diamond. It may be that we can use some of that data to try and get better figures but they won't be quite the same as, as the ones that we've got. Uh, and the, we also want to think about what happens if you've got those close relatives in there as, as matches to your unknown person. Can we correct from that? Maybe um, I need to sit down and think about maths, more complicated maths, and how, how you work that out. And it probably depends also on how distant the relationship is, which makes it uh, a bit uh, complicated. Um, and then finally, uh, just to sum up the places to go, so the shared CM project tool is on the DNA Painter website under the tools menu, Watto is there under the tools menu as well, and the table version. Um, if you want to understand, before you go and use Watto, read Leah's blog series on uh, science the heck out of your DNA, which describes the whole process with <coughs> a lot, and in a lot of, of detail, it takes you through all the steps, look at that. Uh, and if you want to know about what a users group, then uh, that's on <coughs> Facebook. It's just a group called What Are The Odds? Um, uh, this might not help you so much, but we were <laughs> <laughs> Johnny has discovered that we do have a beer. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if we're named after the beer or the beer is named after us. But <laughs> it, probably I would advise you to read to, to drink it after you've used Watto or not. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, yes, let's just go back there. Uh, this tool is going to work better in my father than in me. Correct? In your father than in me? Well, in the sense that just on the previous slide, you have the fact that it's simulations below 40, 40 centimorgans yes. is, is kind of the limit, but my dad will have double the amount of DNA on my father's side, obviously, than I do. Yes. So it, and it, in that sense, it works better for older people who have tested, who were born maybe in 1920 or 1930s. <laughs> is that a general... No, it's, it's a generalisation, but it's... Um, um, yeah, I guess, it's as with all of DNA testing, if you've got the older generation, you get better data. You don't... The other thing I... I forgot to mention is that if you have a parent, then the child's data is no use at all. So just as, as, as Martin was saying earlier, if you've got the parent and you're wanting to reconstruct a, a, a Lazarus genome, then the child got all their DNA from the parent, so there's no information, there's no new information in the child's DNA. And if you put them in, in Watto, it will just ignore them. If you have a match to a parent and a child, it will ignore the child. Um, um, the other thing, of course, is the more complex trees. It, it would be great if you could actually, say for adoptees, if you have an adoptees match and you get a matrix of how each of the matches match each other, put that into the tool and it could generate a best fit tree for your adoptee and you'd be able to see which 
where, where they actually sit in the over, in relation to all of their matches. Is that on the way? <laughs> um, well, there are. You need lots of close matches in that matrix. If you haven't got any genealogical information at all, then you've got to try and recreate the whole tree from the, the matrix of matches. And that means you need to have a good group of close matches where you can reconstruct the small segment of the tree and say, here are some siblings, here are <coughs> no, some aunts and nephews, and I can make this bit of the tree. And then I can say, here's an aunt, here's a nephew, they're matched to this person, indicates that they are first cousin to the aunt and first cousin once removed to the nephew, uh, and I can slot them in because there's only one place they'll go and then build out the tree like that. So you need, you need some really close matches to do that. Okay. But it's on the way. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, and well, the well, medics already have tools that do that. Yes. Um, okay. Um, questions for Johnny. Now, I'm just a bit <laughs> wary of the, the, the microphone here because of... Sorry, sorry. Questions <laughs> for, for Adam. Johnny, ask question. <laughs> <laughs> and I see one at the back. I'm going to turn this down slightly because it may be a little bit on the loud side. Um, and I'll turn you down a little bit as well. Um, so I'm coming down to the back, gingerly. I hope we don't get any screams from the, uh, from the loudspeakers. Okay, question here. Thanks, Andrew. I think it is potentially an amazing tool, but you showed at the outset, or pretty early on, a series of distributions showing the uh, series of um, normal or Gaussian distributions for the expected uh, spread yes. of <coughs> DNA between a set of, yeah, that one. Now, to me, that looks like a series of uh, normal or Gaussian distributions. And the theory for resolution of these has been well developed mathematically in areas of astronomy and physics. Was there any consideration given to looking, because basically, if you look at those, they're all basically the same. All you're looking at are differences in the, and I'm getting a bit mathematical, I was once a mathematician, but that's a long time ago. Differences between what I call the first and second moments, first, second, and third moments of those distributions. And they look to me like you could potentially use <coughs> the techniques developed in astronomy and physics to get better resolution between those and use tools such as chi squared tests or a range of other statistical tests to get resolution, which would tell you, actually, you know, that is a first cousin and it's resolved with a probability of 98 point something. Um, have any of those techniques been applied or has consideration been given to given it over to mathematical nerds? <laughs> so if you have a series of individuals where you think they all have the same relationship, so if you have a, an unknown, but whatever the relationship they have, it must all be a group of first cousins or a group of second cousins or a group of third cousins, then in principle you could do that and say which of these curves fits the distribution of values in that set of cousins. Um, the problem is they're not Gaussian. <laughs> they're, they're, they're complicated, and they're complicated by the... F they're, there are theoretical ideas of what the curves ought to look like, but they're done on the basis that uh, you've got absolutely perfect matching. So most of the... Most of the data we've got has a cutoff of seven, five, or six centimorgans, and segments below that have been stripped out by the, the testing companies. Uh, the theory doesn't take account of that, uh, and it doesn't take account of the fact that there will be small segments which are very old. So it would work for, for these um, distributions that don't come down to <laughs> zero. So uh, probably your second cousins would be OK, but once you get second cousins once removed, there should be some zeros in there, in that distribution, which you're not going to see, uh, not going to be uh, covered by the theoretical curves. And that's where I actually have to simulate what the matching companies are doing. Uh, because you can simulate, the, you can write down the equations for the inheritance <coughs> but that don't take account of that, stripping out those very low matches. Um, so you actually then have to simulate what they're doing, uh, uh, which is, adds a layer of complication. But in principle, Yes, if you've got a group of matches that have the same level of cousinhood, you could use that sort of approach. I'm not sure if it... Because we're using the full probability distribution, I'm not sure that it gives you any more information, but I will think about it. Great. 
Thanks very much. Uh, other questions? Yeah, we have one here from Svetlana. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew and Johnny and Leah. Very interesting uh, tool, and it's probably one of my favorite. Uh, I have, <laughs> I have, I'm using it a lot. So I have a question, a more kind of observation as well. Uh, when you're working through examples, you're showing different hypotheses and how the hypotheses change as you're adding uh, new people. And one thing I find is people struggle sometimes is coming up with hypotheses. Mm -hmm. So have you considered I including suggestions as possible hypotheses? So for example, if somebody matches it at 500 centimorgans, there's only a certain number of limited relationship you can have. So have you considered uh, making suggestions in terms of where the hypothesis could be? Yes, we have, we've, Johnny and I have been talking about how to do that. Part of the problem is, um, that if you say you've got 500 centimorgans and a, uh, a second cousin relationship is possible, there are many different places you can put a second cousin in the tree. So you can end up with a very large number of hypotheses if you're not careful, um, all of which are equivalent to one another statistically. So it's, uh, but we need to think about how to do that. We can, we can certainly generate with the closer the matches you've got, the easier it is to do that sort of thing. If you had you know, a, a 60 centimorgan match as your best one, then there are so many places it could fit in the tree that it probably wouldn't be worth doing. We have a question here from Catherine and from Paddy. Catherine, come forward just to get, to get away from the speaker um, in case we get screamed at by the speaker. Thank you, Andrew and Morris. Um, on the future possibilities slide, you have down uh, more simulations and the below 40 CM and more relationships. To be able to do that, what do you need? Do you need people to join the shared CM project? Where do you, where do you get your da data from? It's I'm, just I'm, I'm going to give you that actually yeah, because, because is this running out? Um, it is going to be easier for you to speak directly into that. Okay, so um, we don't we just like ancestry, we don't need real data, they simulated, it was all done by simulations in a computer. I can simulate what the sharing ought to be given the process of, of recombination. So, uh, and then simulate the stripping out of small segments by the <coughs> companies uh, uh, and uh, predict what the sharing will be for given relationships. So uh, we don't need more, more data to do that. And in fact, I, more data in the shared centimorgan project will probably refine that, but it won't get over the biases that I talked about, which tend to make it to higher values um, the, if you were working the other way around and testing all of your four cousins, what distribution would you get? Okay. Uh, no, if you can hold on to that, I'll give Paddy this. <laughs> I'll have to come around here behind the mic so that I don't <laughs> cause chaos. That was a brilliant presentation, lots of very interesting ideas. A couple of things on your last slide that you might add for future possibilities. You said you weren't using the X chromosome. I'm working on a case where there's an unknown relationship and they're almost sure two ladies have mothers who they think get the same father, but have no X chromosome match, which is about a one in a hundred chance, but it's possible. So it would be lovely to use this to show them exactly what the options are. Next suggestion, I put in my family tree loads of times and I can upload a getcom file to most sites. Do you have any thoughts of allowing getcom upload? That's a, that's a technical question for Johnny. <laughs> so I've modified getcom a little bit to allow the hypothesis to be thrown in. Uh, yeah, because also you want a very simple getcom with just the relevant part of yeah. the tree. We don't want you to upload your thing with 4,000 oh people no. in it. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you have good software, you can select which individuals you want to put out into the getcom. And the last one, if you could go back to the chart where you had cousins on both sides. That one. Mm -hmm. Can I put a cousin in the middle group as well? <laughs> an, uh, so, an, um, an own kid. So if you had a, another line coming down here. Yeah. Yeah, I, there's no reason. All right, good. I have a guess like that, but uh, I want to try it. Because you, you know the relationship to, to the two hypotheses. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. OK. Well done. Thanks, Thank you, Paddy. Any other questions for uh, Andrew? Great. Um, there was one question that I had, and that was in relation to 
um, one of the earlier charts and it was possibly oh let's see now ah yes this is what I want to talk about um, the groups here this is I'm not sure which group it is but you can see that the first group has got a range of different uh, uh, possibilities but if you are 90 years old the chances that it's your great great aunt or uncle is probably fairly remote <laughs> so could you actually um, take uh, the number of people who have reported uh, the variety of different relationships in the shared sense of organ tool, and I know it's biased, but could you take um, the percentages of uh, the proportion of first cousin, second cousin, second cousin once removed, and so on, and adjust it for age, so that you could plug your age into this tool, and then it would say, okay, you've got a 48.06% chance that it's in this group here, but of this group, it's highly or it's more likely that it's going to be a first cousin once removed rather than a great great aunt or uncle. Some of that is but when it's the probability of a relationship just given the ages is probably quite difficult to do. Um, because uh, apart from the very close relationships <coughs> where you can rule out some things and say, no, <coughs> no, this person is ten years younger than me, they can't be my son. Um, that then working out what the probabilities are. I mean, how many you'd have to know? You'd have to know about the population the individual comes from, and you know, what sort of ages they typically get married and have children, mm -hmm. and what the spread of those those things are, which gets a bit complicated. And I'd rather leave it to you to look at the tree and say yeah. this hypothesis <laughs> is not possible. <laughs> this is a genealogical question rather than a genetic question. Sure, sure, great. Great, okay, well, um, listen, thanks very much, Andrew, for a fantastic presentation. Congratulations to Johnny, Andrew, and Leah for producing a wonderful tool, which has again moved forward the whole field of genetic genealogy <coughs> just that little bit more and has given us lots to think about. Andrew Millard, thank you very, very much. Yeah. Was it who asked the first question? Sorry, what was the, the, who asked the first question? Oh, um, I'm not sure actually. Right.